Previously on Gears. All visual Radio, the 2014 Formula One season has begun in earnest. It all started this morning, of course, in Australia, in Melbourne, for this weekend's Australian Grand Prix. Of joining me, of course, is technical whiz man and uh, fellow commentator Vikesh Maharaj. Vic, welcome to the show, my friend. Thanks, Ash. It's been a long time. Yeah, I tell you, the uh, long wait is now over. Yeah, it certainly is over. It was so interesting to watch these cars doing free practice one and two. And I think if you really analyze and look into it, a lot more reliability than we were expecting. Well, this is it. I mean, there are many, many questions that we, we've got to ask about the free practice sessions. But before we do that, Vic, um, you know, a lot of people don't follow the sport as closely as you and I. This year, huge regulation changes. The biggest one, one has to say, is all over what we call Nowadays, the power unit, but I'm actually from now just calling it the damn engine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The engine, 1.6 liter turbocharged engine, V6. You know, there's so many parts and it's such a complicated engine to try and make this thing work. And I think that's why it's called the power unit. I think there's about six or seven different components that compromise the complete power unit. And if you remember in past seasons, if you changed your V8 engine, you had the 10 place penalty or some sort of a grid penalty or sometimes even start at the back of the grid. But the way it works this year is that if you change a certain component or a combination of them or all of them, you have differing levels of um, like a penalty. So whether it could be a five-place grid penalty, a 10-place grid penalty, or if you're really unlucky, a pit lane start. So they, it is quite complicated, uh, but you know, hopefully these guys are getting on top of their problems quite quickly. All right, so we've got this new uh, power unit and engine. The other big news, of course, is 30% less of the fuel, Vic. They can only run 100 kilograms. And one of the biggest fears, I think, for most people is that, you know, we might turn this into an endurance race as, a, as, a, as opposed to a, a flat-out Formula One kind of race. Yeah, I think the purists are uh, sort of upset with this. But, you know, in reality, if you look at the entire season, Probably 80 to 90 percent of the tracks, those 100 kilograms of fuel is not going to be a problem. There are certain tracks that it is a problem at, for example, Bahrain, where they tested in pre-season. And at this particular Grand Prix Australia, a lot of the drivers, including Nico Rosberg this morning, were saying that they've got good pace, but they're actually using too much fuel. So from a strategy perspective and from what we can expect, it is difficult to say if it, we're going to have flat-out racing, there will be elements of the race where at certain points I would, I, would, I would suspect that the guys are going to go a little bit slower. And at other times, I do expect that there will be quite big speed differences. An interesting point that came out, Sasha, at, mm. uh, at the Australian Grand Prix today is that when these guys are saving fuel, you're probably going to lift off a bit e e earlier, coast to the brake marker, brake, and then go into the corner. But what if a guy behind you is racing flat out and you lift? suddenly and start coasting, the speed differential is quite dramatic. Remember, I think uh, Mark Webber had that accident in yeah. Valencia, if I remember correctly. So there's a lot of um, uh, concern that are being raised. Charlie Whiting is saying that if you are coasting, you are saving fuel, you've got to be careful about the guys behind you. So I think the element of danger, the element of risk, and the element of not finishing the race is, is real. But, you know, as you and I will say, that we don't really know until we see this first race unfold. Yeah. We'll then understand the impact of this 100 kilogram of fuel. But, I mean, it's 30% less fuel than last year. I mean, that is quite a significant difference. It, 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 it's a massive difference. We won't go into the aerodynamics of the car just to say that there are fundamental changes. But, uh, you know, there, there, there's so many other things that this weekend is going to be about. That is going to be about reliability. Now, Vic, in the preseason testing, we saw every single team have issues with their power unit and uh, their sense of reliability. Yet today, coming out of free practice one, and I don't want to speak about any specific teams or drivers as yet, um, quite astonishingly, we have seen a, a, a remarkable improvement since the final test in Bahrain. Yeah, that's why I, I, I suppose that's why we think it's a, it's, it is a sport in the world. And probably in terms of uh, the minds of people and the abilities of people, it's probably the best of the best that you are going to get in any form of industry anywhere in the world. And it just shows you how quickly... And how uh, and the ability of these engineers to be able to react to find solutions to problems that a normal motor manufacturer would take 
years to find. You know, there was yeah. quite a good good analogy that we were talking about the other day. What Formula One has achieved in 18 months, a normal motor manufacturer would have probably taken 10 to 12 years. This type of technology, 18 months to two years ago, didn't even exist. So you can understand how on the edge these cars are. But remarkably, these guys have managed to turn a lot of these cars around. Um, they're managing to string lots of laps together, way over 100 laps for the teams on yeah. a Friday. That's unheard of. It must be fantastic for these uh, Australians to watch these cars on the circuit, because normally on a Friday, you don't get that much activity. This was activity almost all the way through. Yeah, it's wonderful stuff. Final thing before we go into team by team, Vic, um, the sound of this new V6 turbo-driven power unit, there have been, I suppose, pros and cons about it. When you heard them uh, this morning, what did you think of them? Well, it was probably the first time I heard these engines driven in anger. You know, we saw yeah. footage from Herod, we saw footage from Bahrain. But this was probably the first inclination we had, and I was—I must say—I was quite impressed. I did quite like the sound, a deeper sound, not that high-pitched sound that we had with the V8s. It's a different type of sound in um, as per the old Formula One. But the one thing that you could see is the noise was directly related to the speed of the car. So if you watch the car from the onboard cameras, you listen to the cars. The cars looked exceptionally quick in a straight line. I think much yes. quicker than last year. They, they accelerate hard. There's wheel spin. The cars go sideways. They look spectacular, and they sound spectacular in their own way. You know, the turbochargers whirring down the pit lane. When the guys are braking, you hear the turbos, you hear the boost. So a whole different symphony of sounds, but I think it's something that we're going to get used to quite quickly and really come to appreciate. Yeah, I must say, I'm glad you said that as well. My sentiment uh, as well. Now, Vic, let's have a look at uh, today. Um, first of all, we've got to look at two teams that seem to be massively behind the eight ball. The first, Caterham Renault, Marcus Ericsson, Kamui Kobayashi, in the two sessions managed to do three laps. Yeah, it's, it's amazing, Sasha. I, I couldn't... I, 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 I was watching probably like you, the few practice one and two sessions, and you could see the frustration levels of the drivers, you know, the, the mechanics, the teams, the engineers are working away furiously. To me, it's just surprising and, um, and amazing that, you know, they're working to the last minute to that sort of extent. Um, and yet you have other teams, when you look at them, they're all relaxed. It's like the mm. normal type of Formula One racing. You know, they're under massive pressure. And I don't know what the resources of that company is, um, whether they'll be able to turn it around quickly. But uh, to me, that's one team under serious pressure. I think Tony Fernandez came out at the start of the season to say that if they don't get results, I think he'll pull his funding from the team going forward into next year. So th I think that is under serious pressure. Yeah, I think so as well. But I think also Mr. Fernandez maybe needs to put a little bit more money into it. But we're, that's for another discussion. Another team, and, and Vic, you've got to feel for these guys. Last year, they were a, a Grand Prix winning team. They lacked some kind of resources. They lost Kimi Raikkonen, but they've got two really, really fast drivers in Romain Grosjean and Pastor Maldonado. We were really hoping for such big things from Lotus Renault, but wow, they look desperate. Yeah, they really do look desperate. You know, the mere fact that they couldn't make the first test in Jerez has really hurt them. You know, they came out with fighting talk. You know, it's not going to hurt us. It gives us more time to get the car as we want it. But, you know, history now shows that it was completely the wrong decision. And it probably was a financial issue as well. I don't think they had funds. Eric Boulier has also let the team. Yeah. A lot of technical staff have moved on. A lot of engineers have moved on. So, you know, I think a lot of teams and people and spectators and fans out there would want this team to do well. They always seem to have uh, sort of a good uh, engineering background to them and a good racing team. But unfortunately, it really looks like... Um, uh, they're in a hiding here, and unfortunately, I, I really cannot see how soon they're going to they're going to turn this around. We yeah. saw some footage of Romain Grosjean in testing in Bahrain. I think it was yeah. he was really unhappy, and Grosjean is not normally that type of character. I, I, it was the first time that I've seen him do that, so I do suspect that the problems are real, and the pace is bad. You know, they are, if I'm not mistaken, I think Grosjean just managed to beat. Uh, a Mauritio to be That's second right. last, or probably our last, I think. I don't know, you know. So it's actually quite bad to consider the team was a front runner and now they probably lost. 
Yeah, it's really, really tough times for, for Lotus Renault. Let's put a group, a couple of teams here together. The Marussia, where it runs now with a Ferrari engine. The Toro Rosso, which now runs with the Renault engine as opposed to the Ferrari engine. And then the Sauber Ferrari team. You've got to say, looking at the times today, Vic, and we'll, we'll discuss the times in a short while, but they seem to be relatively close to each other. And I mean, for Marussia, that must be incredible. Well, I think it is incredible. You know, it's the team has shown a constant upward trend in the last couple of years and the, to actually get this car designed to look like a contemporary Formula 1 car, it's got all the right bits in the right places and then obviously to put the Ferrari engine in and to show some reasonable pace, reasonable reliability for a small team and we've got to admit that they don't have the resources of the big teams I think it's a fantastic job, a great great job and you know if they are reliable, Sasha, you never know what could happen on a Sunday, they could possibly <laughs> one of these minnow teams scoring their first point. Yeah, that, that I think should be a lot of fun. Um, Sauber just seemed to, uh, one would expect they've got the Ferrari power in there, but I just don't know also, are they also maybe lacking a, a little bit of the resources or do they really, um, are, are they really struggling, Vic, not having a guy like Nico Hulkenberg? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, if you look at the car, it doesn't have grip. They seem to be struggling to get the car. Uh, with the Ferrari engine, you understand, if you look at the Ferrari works cars, they look to be strong. They've got good pace. They're quick in sector one. They're quick on the straights. That tells me that the Ferrari power unit is working well. In the installation that they've got, in the chassis they've got, from day one, Sauber have had problems. And Adrian Sitzel did come out and say that, you know, they've got to turn it around. They're expecting lots of updates in a completely different car. And... You know, when the sort of talk comes out, you can really say that uh, it shows you the uh, resources of the team. And I think Sauber is struggling in that respect. And, you know, you know it's going to be quite difficult for them to turn around because it's not that they can point that they've got a problem with the power unit. The power unit is good. Yeah. It is a competitive power unit. So it's now a resource of the team. Get aer aerodynamic grip. It looks like it's lacking aero grip. Uh, we'll have to see. You know, historically, last year and the year before, Sauber has looked after its tie as well. So we've got to see what it's like in race pace. But in out and out pace, they seem to be struggling. Okay, now we're still looking at, at the way the guys finished today. But we'll we'll get some analysis from from Vic on the on the times. But uh, after the preseason testing, Vic, you know, we all sat together and we said, okay, there's some kind of a pecking order: Mercedes, Williams, perhaps Force India, then Ferrari, and then maybe further down we might find Red Bull. Now, Red Bull are the champions. They've had all sorts of problems in preseason testing. They come out today. They must be feeling quietly confident. Well, I think they're probably ecstatic. I, I don't think um, us, and I suppose even them in their wildest dreams, expected them between uh, between the two drivers to do 115 laps in total. Yeah. I don't think they could string that in the entire preseason testing. Maybe they knew exactly what was wrong, and they knew the cure that needed to be done. That obviously shows that the team is very focused, and whatever they've done seems to have helped. You know, they've probably compromised the aero a bit to try and get extra cooling. We know it's a temperature-related and a packaging-related issue. Um, the car looked good on the circuit. I must say, from what I could see, it really turned well. It braked well. It was very good in the high-speed corners. So we probably expect Red Bull to have good aerodynamics, to have good mechanical grip, to be able to look after the tyres. They've got a fit. They've probably got the best driver at the moment in Formula 1, Vettel there as well. Ricardo didn't disgrace himself. So everything looks good. You know, there was a yeah. little thing that came up from Christian Horner. He says that they are losing between a three quarters to, of a second to one second a lap on the straight. So that obviously wow. means that the Renault power unit is not quite at the level of Mercedes. So if you factor in that sort of uh, three quarters to one second, they're right there. The car is right, exactly. the packaging is good. Every single driver and every single engineer who's looked at that car said that the car is exemplary. So <laughs> if they can turn it around at the speed that they've done since Bahrain, I'm really expecting a very, very strong Red Bull package in the next race or two. Probably not Australia. However, we can see in the next couple of races, I would really say Red Bull is going to win races this year. Yeah, I must say, uh, that turnaround has been dramatic and really up there as well. Just to let you know, Sebastian Vettel finished fourth and Danny Ricciardo finished in sixth position on the second free practice times. Um, Vic, two teams, uh, the Force India, Nico Hulkenberg and of course Sergio Perez. 
And then we have the Williams team, Valtteri Bottas, and we've got Felipe Massa. Now, after preseason testing, Williams looked as though they really were the second favourites in terms of, of uh, a pecking order. All of a sudden, things seem to have changed quite a lot today, but we, we also got to be careful how much we read into all of the times. Yeah, you know, the thing is, you don't know the fuel levels. And, um uh, these guys are probably running differing fuel levels at this stage just to understand a few things. Uh, we know that a lot of the guys were running pace in terms of uh, ultimate lap times that they wouldn't be able to finish the race at that sort of pace because they're using too much fuel. So there's a few things that we still got to understand about the regulations. We know that Pat Simmons and Rod Nelson, I think, was the chief test engineer there, they come from very high pedigree. You know, uh, they've won world championships. They're not going to go out there for headline times, I hope. Mm, mm, <laughs> I, think yeah. all, I, think, I, think, I think we're all hoping for a strong Williams. The car looked good. It looked reliable. It did a lot of laps. There were no issues with the car. They worked on setup. They worked on understanding the tires, a bit of aero working. So I'm expecting Williams to come on stronger. They tend to run a bit heavier during the free practice session. So let's see how it all pans out. Then we'll know whether testing is a good barometer of what we can expect in, in, in racing. But I'm, I'm still hopeful of a good Williams performance. Yeah. All right. The last three teams, McLaren, Mercedes, Jensen Button, and the new driver, Kevin Magnussen. You've got to say they'd be happy with, uh, with what they showed today. And then uh, the two teams, I think Ferrari will be very, very happy where they are. Fernando Alonso in third position, only half a second off Lewis Hamilton. Raikkonen having a couple of problems, 1.2 seconds uh, off the pace. Those two teams, uh, Vic, is this what maybe you would have expected um, before everything started today? Probably not, Sasha. I think when we discussed it earlier in the week, you know, we thought Ferrari and McLaren were a little bit off the pace. Uh, uh, there were rumours that Ferrari were sandbagging and testing, and we couldn't understand the reason for that. I must say the Ferrari car, especially in Fernando Alonso's hands, looked particularly good, especially in Sector 1. Um, mm -hmm. The quick change of direction, the car really looked hooked up, really um, fantastic in his, in his hands, um, which tends to sort of go with a slightly lower fuel load. You know, again, it's, uh, we're not sure exactly if that is right. We'll see tomorrow in qualifying when they really give these cars a full head of steam. Uh, but yeah, the Ferrari looks good. It looks very good. Um, it's braking well and um, it's turning well. It's got good straight line speed. So all the ingredients are there. Um, the uh, word from Marinello is that the correlation between the wind tunnel and the racetrack is spot on. So, you know, I would expect um, a strong Ferrari based on the free practice performance. And, uh, you know, similarly with uh, Jensen Button, he looked yeah. fantastic in Sector 2, purple sector all the time in Sector 2. So those two cars are looking quite impressive. And if they're not running low fuel loads or lower fuel loads than the other, they're going to be very competitive come Sunday. That's for sure. And then I suppose, Vic, no surprises. We did expect Mercedes to be quick, um, specifically at this first Grand Prix. They came out in free practice to nothing between Nico Rosberg and, and Lewis Hamilton. They will be very, very happy. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, they're the pre-season favourites. They lived up to that favourite uh, tag, especially in free practice too. Um, they did the race pace simulations at the end. And um, they were about a second a lap faster than everyone else. Wow, wow, wow. And then, wow. And, then a, and then it was a bunch between the Red Bull, the Williams, and the Ferrari, and the McLaren. That was a close bunch. But, uh, but Mercedes were about a second a lap faster. And a lot of people were saying, you know, coming prior to this race, I think even Christian Horner said, you know, the Mercedes, if they really get it right and really let mm -hmm. it go properly, they're going to lap everyone twice. And I hope that it's not the case. The team looks good. If you watched all the um, on-board footage, the car does what you want it to do. If you look at the team in the pits, the car's just standing there on their stilts. They do a few setup changes, and it's like the old type of Formula One racing. There's no, there's not a lot of people working on the car. There's no reliability concerns. Okay, Lewis had the problem with a sensor issue in, in free practice one. But other than that, the team is working fantastically well. You've got to say... The package and the building blocks are all there yeah. for them to have a very strong championship season. The important thing that we've all got to understand is that, you know, the race on Sunday is a race into the unknown. We don't know what is going to happen. There were rumors of everyone not finishing, and we, and we <laughs> talked about it. But I think there could be a lot more cars finishing, and 
reliability will determine the championship, and that's a fact. Yeah, that is the fact. And I think, listen, you answered my question. I mean, the times, yes, at the moment, there's only a point one between Rosberg, only half a second between Alonso and Lewis Hamilton. But the critical point about specifically Friday testing, you know, even though we're in such a new situation, Vic, your Friday testing, you're still going to go through similar procedures. And the most important one is the heavy runs and Mercedes have a dominant advantage at this stage over the likes of McLaren, Red Bull and Ferrari? Yeah, if you look at um, last year's um, situation, I think they've learned all their lessons how to manage the tyres. Pirelli have brought a more conservative tyre and at the end of the day, maybe that's playing into, into, into Mercedes' hands and strengths. So rear tyre wear, are probably, or they are probably hopeful they're not going to have an issue. Although in Bahrain we saw it, and if a guy's too aggressive with his right foot, I think we saw Kimi Raikkonen spin the car, mm-hmm. I think, on the last day of testing at Bahrain. So you've really got to manage the traction uh, situation. And luckily for them at, uh, at this particular circuit, there's not a lot of low-speed traction corners as much as, say, Bahrain, etc. So therefore, you could say maybe temperatures are a bit lower as well. They're racing into the evening, so... You know, I think Mercedes could have a, a reasonable shot at the, at the at the race wing race win based on free practice two performance. And you know, you, as you say, you simulate qualifying, you simulate a heavy fuel load, you do your calculations, you go through your procedures. If you are fast in free practice two on a Friday, normally that bodes very well for the rest of the weekend because the, the track rubbers in it gets faster, the team learns, and if you're fastest probably going to carry that on for the rest of the weekend. Yeah, there we go. Um, Vic, I mean, mean, very, very informative about uh, this coming Grand Prix. As you mentioned earlier, and I I go with the statement as well, we actually don't know. Mercedes could be unbelievable in qualifying. They could run out of fuel. Ferrari could blow up. Red Bull could blow up. uh, Marussia could win. We really don't know what can happen this Sunday. But I think we're into a brand new era of uh, Formula One and one that I think we are going to grow to love more and more and uh, hopefully gives us really exciting racing. Yeah, I totally agree with you, Sasha. Uh, you know, we were all not so sure when the regulations were put out. Um, it was a very expensive change for Formula One, but I think Formula One had to change and had to move with the times, had to move with the world. And, you know, it's a greener future for Formula One. A lot of engine recovery. Um, it's very sophisticated. It is very cutting edge. Um, so I think at the end of the day, it probably is the correct direction Formula One had to go. We have to change our perceptions a bit. But from what I've seen in terms of the, uh, of the cars on circuit, the sound of the cars, the visual look of the cars, the driver's activities, I think it's the right direction. And I think um, it's going to be fantastic for the fans. I think it's going to be something very, very special. Vic, my friend, enjoy the Grand Prix on Sunday. I'm sure we will chat on Monday. And uh, who knows, it could be a very bizarre conversation. Yeah, fantastic. I'm really looking forward to it, Sasha. Thanks a lot for having me. All right, there we go. Thank you very much. My good friend Vic Maharaj and I think a lengthy Formula One report today because, of course, it is the first Grand Prix. I think we all need to know what's uh, going on. But after what we've seen today in Free Practice 1 and Free Practice 2, Mercedes, yes. And as we we, we predicted before or uh, well, after the preseason testing, are going to be the number one team. But behind them, it is pretty much very, very open. Gears. Gears on balls.co.za. Weekdays, 1 p.m. to 3 p.m.